A little while ago, I played through an obscure PAL exclusive PlayStation game called Dreams, a game so incredibly strange and incredibly bad that it kind of lingers on in my mind. Dreams was the product of a French development studio named Cryo Interactive. They had some commercial success in the 90s, mostly with adventure games like the Atlantis series, but beyond that, Cryo Interactive also had quite the reputation for being a purveyor of the highest grade Eurojank around, and this is especially true when it comes to their PS1 output. Now, while I've already covered Dreams on this channel, it made me realize that a lot of Cryo's games don't actually have a whole lot of coverage on the internet as a whole. So I thought maybe it's time I do my part and try to let people in on the obscure world of Cryo's PS1 releases, because if you thought Dreams was bad, well, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. So let's begin where all good stories start, the year 1997, with one of Cryo's earliest releases on the PlayStation, Pax Corpus, a game that I doubt many have heard of, and probably for good reason. But in my never-ending quest to make YouTube videos that appeal to the smallest viewer base possible, we might have actually stumbled upon one of Cryo's most interesting games. A game that really is the definition of more than meets the eye. So before we get into Pax Corpus, first we need to take a little detour and talk about the beloved 90s animated series Aeon Flux. Aeon Flux was created by animator Peter Chung and first appeared as part of MTV's Liquid Television, an amazing and incredibly forward-thinking show that was the launchpad for many of the 90s most iconic animated series, including Beavis and Butthead and Daria. If you haven't watched this stuff before, a good chunk of it is on YouTube and some of the animation showcased here is still jaw-dropping even today. It's also really, really weird. Aeon Flux was one of the standouts of Liquid Television, which is no surprise when you see it in motion. A blend of dystopian science fiction, biopunk, sex appeal, and just this raw edginess. There was really nothing else like this in American animation at the time. It was strange, it was unique, and it was exciting. Aeon Flux eventually got its own standalone series outside of the Liquid TV banner, which is how I myself first stumbled upon the show as a very confused child staying up way too late to watch weird music videos on MTV. It was also around this time that rumours broke out about a potential Aeon Flux video game hitting the market. And as it turned out, the rumours were true. An Aeon Flux game was in development for the PS1. And who was behind the helm? You guessed it, Cryo Interactive. Now it may not come as a surprise to you, but Cryo's Aeon Flux video game never got released. It was actually pretty far into development and you can see plenty of footage of the game online, but the game was supposedly cancelled due to a merger between Viacom and Virgin Interactive, which resulted in all of Viacom's current video game projects just being completely scrapped. So, in spite of months of work and the game being almost finished, unfortunately this was the end of Cryo Interactive's big Aeon Flux video game. Or was it? Not being one to simply just throw away all their hard work, Cryo decided, okay, what if Aeon Flux? But ever so slightly different. And thus Pax Corpus was born, a game that is quite literally the Aeon Flux PS1 game, but now stripped of all features that might make them get hit by a big copyright lawsuit. The gameplay is almost one-to-one -one with the original Aeon Flux footage, from the abilities to the environments. The only major differences are some of the graphical and HUD elements, as well as the characters and story, which has now been changed to an original narrative that is in no way a weird low-budget French take on an Aeon Flux episode. So, as you can imagine, as soon as I found out the developer of Dreams also developed a long-lost Aeon Flux game that managed to resurface as one of the PS1's most obscure PAL exclusives, well, there is no way I was not going to play it, for better or for worse. Although it's almost definitely worse. Plus, when I was trying to look up footage for this game, it was another case where I couldn't find any clips beyond the first few levels. So today, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to get to experience something very special. You're going to be the first on the internet to see beyond the first few levels of Pax Corpus. And maybe, if we're really lucky, the first to see the online debut 
of the game's ending. I know, it's a big moment. Well, without further ado, it's about time we got into Pax Corpus. So you see these two lovely ladies on the title screen. These are our two main characters. On the left, we have Kali, our protagonist and player character. And on the right, we have Kiana, our antagonist and the head of the evil Alcyon Corporation. Pax Corpus takes place in the world of Oz Nama, a planet composed entirely of women who rely on the Alcyon Corporation's cloning technology to reproduce. All the men are either dead or sterile brainwashed slaves at this point. Now while an all-female cyber utopia where everybody wears leather might sound like a good thing, for the people living on Oznama, it is really anything but, and the threat of a rebellion against the Alcyon Corporation and its dystopian way of living is ever increasing by the day. So Kiana decides to take matters into her own hands by hijacking one of the company's projects called the Pax Corpus, a device initially designed to cure depression but can actually be used to control people's thoughts and effectively turn them into mindless slaves. But the creator of the project, Dr. Elise, steals the Pax Corpus unit to prevent it falling into the hands of Kiana and the Elcyon Corporation. Recipient, Kiana Soro. Personal. My dear Kiana, we have finally achieved our aim. The Pax Corpus project is operational. By the time you receive this message, I will be far from the Alcyon officers. Pax Corpus was designed as a remedy and not a weapon. Do I have to remind you that its primary aim was to control the minds of depressed people in order to offer them inner peace? Using Pax Corpus on a wide scale means the definitive destruction of any trace of humanity in the population of Oznama. Now I hope that someone will have the guts to destroy our creation. I have offered you my body and my mind. But you shall never control my soul, nor that of our people. We shall probably never see each other again. Forgive me. So this is where our game starts, with you taking on the role of the mercenary Kali, tasked with reaching Dr. Elise and the Pax Corpus project before the Alcyon Corporation does. And you know what? This is kind of an interesting premise for a game, I'm not gonna lie. But, and it's a big but, from this point on, everything kind of just goes off the rails, so uh... Yeah, let's just get right into the gameplay. Alright, so this is Pax Corpus. Eh, uh, it's kind of weird. I suppose an easy way to describe it is that it's a sci-fi action game that controls like an even jankier Tomb Raider. Kali has some of the acrobatic moves that Lara does, like being able to roll, backflip, and uh, shimmy ever so slightly to the left and right. She can also crouch in an unnecessarily stylish way, but sure in an outfit like that, why wouldn't you? Of course, all my dicking about in the opening area is quickly interrupted by the game's first enemy, which I first thought was this head in a computer, but it turns out to be this gal instead. One shot, and she's dead. Now, combat is an interesting one in this game. You've got some simple melee attacks, which, uh, work, I guess? Sometimes? But the majority of the time, you'll be taking out enemies using your handy blaster, although the way this weapon works is a little unusual. Firing your blaster has about a one second delay from when you press the button until Kali lifts her arm up and fires, which really takes some getting used to. Also, if you just tap the button, she will immediately drop her arm after firing, which delays the time between your next shot even further. The secret to firing your weapon in this game is to actually just hold down the fire button and just keep your arm up and blast away to your heart's content. Your basic weapon has unlimited ammo and doesn't need to reload, so seriously, just go ham. If you're not playing Pax Corpus by strutting into each room gun first, then let me tell you, you're playing it wrong. Thankfully, this method of combat is possible thanks to the game's auto-aim. Once you enter into an enemy's general vicinity, the aim will automatically focus on them, so you can worry more about perfecting your catwalk strut than actually having to worry about your enemy's positions. Anyway, the opening level of this game consists of just two enemies and two rooms, and is notable because the transition from level to level actually takes longer than the level itself. So Pax Corpus is split into five different locations that make up the game's 20 different levels. You'll know you've beaten a level when you come across one of the game's loading screens, which you will spend a good 60 or so seconds in. So after getting out of loading screen hell, we are now in the game's second level, the train station. I start off by immediately shooting an innocent civilian, which thankfully comes with zero consequences, so I do it again. Well, would you look at that? That's, uh, that's certainly interesting. By the way, this is the first level that we come across something called Pax Corpus Radiation. In certain levels, you'll discover areas or enemies that glow with a bright blue light. The blue colouring is the result of Pax Corpus Radiation, and if you get exposed to too much of it, you'll lose your mind permanently to its effects. 
You'll hear a little sound anytime you wander into a Pax Corpus zone, but you can also track your radiation levels using the little upside down triangle on your hood. I suppose now is as good a time as any to talk about the hood because I'm sure some of you have noticed by now that the left side of the hood looks a little bit off, which isn't a visual bug by the way, that's just how the game shipped. In the top right we have a radar which is very useful for detecting enemies before they see you, allowing you to easily walk and shoot ahead of time. In the bottom right we have this circle that represents your health and next to it is the aforementioned radiation gauge which gives you a game over if it ever reaches max capacity. And finally over in Jank City on the left we have your special weapons which we'll get into as we move throughout the game. Now while Pax Corpus radiation is generally pretty bad it's also kind of useful too. Radiation drains away once you leave an irradiated area, but any remaining radiation you have left over also converts itself into health. So if you don't mind standing around for a little bit, it can actually be a good way to get back some health in an emergency. Anyway, the train station turns out to be another very small level. There's a few more civilians and guards to beat up, and once you beat up the guard that drops the access key, you can then move through the only locked door in the area to take on the final guard. By the way, if you get knocked down in this game, your only way to get back up is by using a handstand which moves the character backwards. You have no control over this and it absolutely will not cause me any hassle as the game goes on. So after killing this enemy by, uh, I don't know, kneeing him in the face or something, we move on to the final level of mission 1. So unsurprisingly, the level after the train station takes place on a train. The goal here is to move from carriage to carriage until we reach the end where we believe Dr. Elise is currently located. This is once again another very small level, it's pretty much 7 identical rooms connected to one another but I mean, that's kind of what trains are so I guess I can't really be surprised. Soon into the level you'll start hearing what sounds like dog noises only to be greeted by this thing. I guess these are the dogs of this world. Normally I'd feel bad about shooting dogs in a video game but I think we'll make an exception for these guys. This level also gives us our first usable item, an energy pickup that grants you a full instant heal for Kali. You can only hold one of these at a time though, so if you ever come across another while you're down on health, you might as well use it and just keep yourself stocked up. This level also introduces us to these tiny glowing enemies. They aren't very dangerous, but they do explode when they are killed, so as long as you keep your distance from these guys, they're pretty much a complete pushover. Eventually at the end of the level, we enter into the longest of the train carriages and stumble upon Dr. Elise. Kali, I see that Kiana has sent the best of her guard bitches. Why do you always have to meddle in everything? I'm here to help you, Ellie. Open this gate. The two of us together can stop Kiana. Open up. No one can help me. I am the seed of the apocalypse. Leave me and return to your mistress. So you prefer to play tough, huh? Now there's actually a lot to unpack here. Kali, one of Kiana's guard bitches. The Kali used to work for the Alcyon Corp of Kiana. And what is Dr. Elise saying about being the seed of the apocalypse? I, for one, can't wait to see how this all pans out. But no time to worry about that now because we're into the game's first boss battle against Dr. Elise. Which also happens to be the first roadblock I hit during the game. The good doctor is protected behind an impenetrable laser grid, so I figured the only option here is to shoot at the doctor, which, uh, turns out, doesn't work. She seems to be able to dodge every single thing I fire at her, including bullets that actually seem to hit her character model. Of course, Dr. Elise is able to fire back using her own gun, which unfortunately I am not impervious to. So after a pointless back and forth of shooting between the two of us, I eventually succumb to my bullet wounds and get my first game over. The consequences of a game over are three things. You start at the beginning of the current level, all your items have been reset, and you also have to wait through a 60 plus second loading screen to get back into the game. It's not the worst, but you definitely don't want to die if ever possible. Round 2 with the Doctor goes a little bit better after I discover that the first person view in this game actually serves another purpose beyond simply looking around. While in this view, certain switches and items can be highlighted with a target reticule and if you press the fire button while in this view, you will then fire your gun at said target. In this case, it's used to hit a power box behind the Doctor. I initially thought you have to shoot this a set number of times to shut down the laser grid, but alas, I get shot a few too many times and get another game over. So we try again, shoot the power box again, and we die again. Okay, after many minutes of loading, on the fourth attempt we make a breakthrough. What you've got to do is actually hit the doctor with the blast from the power box. I swear, every character in this game is just trying to show off their core strength whenever possible. The good news is that from this point on, if you time the shots correctly, the doctor kind of just gets stuck in a loop and drops down pretty quickly. 
Once you beat the doctor, she then flees into the train and retreats to a little cutscene for her trouble. Okay, so if you're wondering what happened here like I did, Alcyon Corp rigged the train, kidnapped the Doctor, and have now acquired the Pax Corpus unit. The Doctor has now been transferred to a prison complex, and since we have no idea where we might be able to find the Pax Corpus unit, well, we have no choice but to try find our Doctor friend in prison. So, off we go. The prison is one of the longest missions in Pax Corpus, and it's also where the game really begins to fuck with you. Now interestingly, this opening prison level that starts out in a delightfully green and purple bathroom, this is also the same level shown in the Aeon Flux gameplay and the level layout seems to be one to one as well. Now clearly the Aeon Flux footage looks significantly better than our gameplay for Pax Corpus and that's probably down to a few things. For one, Pax Corpus only ever got a PAL release on the PlayStation and with that comes the traditional black bars and mildly gimped frame rate that all PAL gamers must bear. So that means we're looking at a lovely sub 20 frame rate the whole way through the game, which really ain't all that uncommon for 3D action games of the time, especially if you're buying the PAL version. Although even with the bump in frame rate that 60Hz usually brings, I still don't think Pax Corpus would be hitting the visual quality shown here in Aeon Flux. Sure this is an unfinished build, but it's clearly much faster and much higher res than what we got here on the PS1. Now if you run Pax Corpus through an emulator and buff the resolution up and then add some anti-aliasing, it certainly looks a little closer to Aeon Flux, but still nowhere near as good I'd say. This leads me to believe that this Aeon Flux footage could represent a possible PC version of the game rather than a PS1 version. It's a possibility because Pax Corpus also got a PC release, which while identical to the PS1 version on the gameplay front, actually looks much closer to the Aeon Flux gameplay that we have access to. I still don't think it looks quite as good as Aeon Flux and there was no official announcement that that game was ever coming to PC, but this theory at least seems to connect the dots somewhat. Anyway, we'll talk more about Pax Corpus's uh, visuals shortly. We've got a prison to infiltrate. So this level is much bigger and more complex than any level we played before and it's also got an interesting gimmick that we'll have to mess around with to proceed. First things first, this level introduces us to security cameras. If they spot you, they tend to send a guard to your location, but I found getting into range to target them through the fog usually means it's gonna spot you anyway, so I don't know, just shoot the guards, it's no biggie. In this room, there's a console that you can interact with to unlock some of the cell blocks around the prison. Now these locks are timed and there are four different block entrances that are dotted all around the map. So when you unlock one prison block and check inside, you'll then need to run back, activate the console, then make your way to the next prison entrance. Now thankfully the design of the map is kind of like a rectangle, so once you've made a lap of the place and taken out all the guards along the way, it's actually pretty easy to navigate through. Although you are going to come across some laser gates that kind of activate at will. Alright, I'll take it. So the prison blocks contain a mixture of different things. One of them is a dud with nothing in it. The next one contains your first weapon power up called plasma. These are limited but pop up pretty frequently throughout the game. These function pretty much like a normal blaster shot but do double the damage. You equip your special items from within your equipment menu which also shows off some more Tomb Raider influence. This is also where you go to use your energy packs to regain health if you remember those from about 5 minutes ago. Once you've equipped your weapon, just press the triangle button and there you go, Plasma City. Of the remaining two prison blocks, one contains a pass key which you'll pick up by killing the guards inside and the last one contains a door that you can use the pass key on. 
Although at first I thought this was a dodgy texture rather than a door, but alas, I guess this was meant to be somewhat transparent. At least the effect works from this angle, I guess. Going this way, we get to strut around and kill some more guards, but we also come across these friendly blue people. They won't attack you, but standing too close to these guys also starts to fill up your pack's corpus meter, so you might as well heal up a little if you need it. They also give us hints about trash shoots and some guy called the Executioner. Get rid of the Executioner to find the way. Yo, listen up. So after we leave those guys alone so they can listen to Eiffel 65 in peace, our next task is to open all the prison cells within the various blocks and start a riot. If you're wondering how I knew to do that, I didn't. It just took me 15 minutes of wandering aimlessly and pressing buttons randomly until I accidentally triggered it. So you've got to enter this new console room, lock the door behind you, and then open all the cells by using the console in the center. This supposedly instigates a riot, but you're stuck in the room until it's done, so you don't get to see anything. Once it lets you back out, well, the whole place is empty. This does mean that you get to backtrack around to all the open prison cells to find that they're also pretty much entirely empty. But hold up, there is a secret in this level. If you use your target vision to look at the wall in this cell, you'll see a cursor pop up, but to blow it up, you'll need to use a plasma shot, which thankfully we've managed to collect quite a few of now in this level. This leads us to a secret area with a neat fixed camera perspective, which is one of the very few times this ever happens in the game. Anyway, the secret passage leads us to the armory, which allows us to bag a missile power up. These are very, very strong, so I'm gonna be saving these for later. Anyway, that's about it for this level, which by the way took me nearly the entire length of my playtime in chapter 1 to complete, and was very confusing, and I hate it, and I never want to see it again. So let's enter the teleporter and travel to an even worse level. Welcome to the Executioner's Quarters. So this level is broken up into two parts, a small section full of lasers at the beginning, and then whatever lies behind this door. I hope it's not the dud. So basically we need to navigate some laser gates to make it to the end of this corridor so we can open up the skull door. This is the part of the game that begins to require Kali's platforming and acrobatic abilities, although I'm gonna warn you now, they are far from graceful. The goal here is to target these little switches on the ceiling to create gaps within the laser grid. In case you missed me phasing true existence earlier, Kali can both jump and double jump. If it looks kinda wonky, that's because it is. Kali also has the ability to roll, which is pretty much used exclusively for getting under lasers, but as you can see, I kind of forgot how to do it here for a few moments. For some reason, it's the shimmy and jump button together, rather than the crouch and jump button together. Doesn't make any sense to me, but what would I know? I'm not from France. While here, you can stare into cells and watch the prisoners run around if you like. Looks like they're having a good time. So after stumbling over some more lasers, we reach the end of the room and activate the console at the end, which opens the skull door back at the beginning. But in doing so, we've also just opened up the prison cells. This means we can now go in and say hi to the prisoners. Oh yeah, the console also activated this big red laser gate, but it moves really slowly and you can just kind of pop in and blow up some more TVs while you wait for it to go by. Once we make it back and enter into the school room, we find this guy. Alright, so this is the executioner, and conveniently, this is also where most online footage of this game seems to stop. Similarly to Dr. Elise, the Executioner also seems to be able to deflect every shot I fire at him, and this includes special weapons. So naturally, it's time to explore the room and see if there are any objects we can target. There is not. The room does look suitably creepy though. Wonder what happened to this guy? Probably nothing good. So I kind of just shoot at the Executioner for a little while to stop him from moving while I think of something to do. One thing I thought might work is to duck under the Executioner and see if I can damage him while he attacks above me. Eh, this does not work. So we're back to the game over screen, which unfortunately means we gotta do some laser acrobatics all over again. Not much longer until we're back at the Executioner and the cycle begins again, and I do much, much worse this time. So we get back there again, and this time I figure out that he enters a run animation whenever you shoot at him, so maybe I think it's a good time to quickly duck underneath, maybe try to hit him with a quick uppercut, and no, dead again. On the fourth attempt, I try to see if I can maybe run behind the Executioner and try to attack him in the back, and as you can imagine, this also did not go very well. So at this point, I figured I've wasted enough time and go to the allreliablegamefacts.com. Now, from experience, walkthroughs for Cryo PS1 games, they, uh, they're not all that common. Dreams on the PS1 didn't have one, and it took me way longer than I'd like to admit to beat the first boss in that game, but thankfully, there exists an angel out there by the name of Bloomer from the beautiful country of Australia, and he is here to save the day. They didn't only just write a walkthrough for Pax Corpus, but a really fucking good one. 
A game like this does not deserve the effort this guy put in, but I am very, very glad they did. Funnily enough, the reason this guide even exists is because Bloomer also got stuck on this very same boss back in 2001, and he actually went to the effort of writing to Cryo Interactive for tips on how to beat him. And would you believe it, Cryo actually got back to them, and supplied them with a kind of mini walkthrough that actually served as the groundwork for this full walkthrough that Bloomer created. So there you go, that was lucky. So what's the secret to beating the Executioner? Well, we kind of already figured it out. You gotta shoot him in the back. But of course, as we know, shooting him in the back ain't that straightforward. So what you've gotta do is actually run to one of the corners in the room and from there shoot the Executioner once. This causes the Executioner to make a beeline for the position that you were in when you fired the shot. During the period where the Executioner is running over to that spot, you have an opportunity to get behind them and shoot him while he is in that running animation. During this animation is the only time he will take any damage. You'll need to do this a couple of times, but once you actually know what you need to do, then the boss fight ends up being surprisingly easy. So is this terrible boss design or are we all just really stupid? I'll let you decide, but the good news is that with that out of the way, we can now roll on into the garbage chute and down into the next level. This level begins with you dicking about on some conveyor belts that transport us into an incinerator. Needless to say, standing around in this area for too long will drain your health, so instead of standing around, I opted to just run around, wasting time instead. The goal here is to blow up some boxes with plasma ammo to get on out, and thankfully the game does leave us some ammo nearby, so it's no big hassle. The guards in this level see a return to the game's trademark awkward death poses, which you can never get too much of really. In terms of size, this level is probably the biggest we've come across yet, and it's also probably the trolliest one too. So if you shoot some switches in this first open area, you can unlock a door to what seems like a kitchen, although this area has a really weird sound playing, almost like some sort of radio interference. Okay, so that was gas. Clearly we're not in the most technologically advanced kitchen if we're still using gas stoves. Okay, so we'll try this again a little more carefully this time. The gas noise seems to trigger only when you cross over a set line in the level geometry. Okay, so I guess we know how this works then. Kitchen bad, over here, good. So let's try that again from the gas free zone. Wow, first try, not bad. Aw, oh, come on, this guy survived? And stay like that, not reporting a gas leak, are you insane? So our reward for beating that area was just some missiles and also getting trapped in a freezer. See, it's just like Tomb Raider. Of course, being stuck in a freezer, my life begins draining immediately and my first reaction is to shoot the meat for some reason. Not sure meat's meant to explode like that, but Eh, what do I know? Of course, the answer is once again to plasma your way out of there, which leads us back to the main room with the switches. The only other direction from this place currently has a laser gate blocking it off, so it's time to backtrack and shoot at switches randomly until something works. And what do you know? It did. So this gives us access to the transit zone, and by transit, I mean conveyor belt nightmare zone. So this is the game's first real platforming section, because of course, this game really needed platforming. My first attempt honestly went better than expected, but it still doesn't mean it went well. So we go through the game over cycle, the long loading screen, the kitchen of death again, and we try again. So as you can see, it's going well. Eventually I learned that you can delay the second jump in Kali's double jump if you time it just right, and that allows you to clear the bigger gap, and holy shit we did it. Of course, that's only just the beginning. Now we gotta make it back, and surprisingly, now that I've got the jump timing down, it's not too bad. Although the possibility of getting a game over and having to start from the beginning of the level each time, it makes every single jump very, very unnerving. So through what I can only assume is some act of God, I managed to make it through the remainder of the conveyor belt section without dying. So you might think this is where the level ends, but wait, there's more. Next up we've got to traverse a maze, a maze full of enemies, and if you die, you gotta do the conveyor belts all over again. So as you can imagine, another very fun segment. The only possible solution I could think of was to just walk through the maze aimlessly while always shooting and just to follow the enemies that showed up on the minimap, and to my surprise, this actually worked. Seriously, when in doubt, just walk and shoot. 
Now you might think after the kitchen, the fridge, the conveyor belt, and the maze, this is where the level might end. But I'm not done yet! So we gotta fight our way through some dog kennels, and this time the enemies actually kinda look like dogs? Oh, I feel bad now. There's one more room of dogs left to go, but I'm gonna try and minimize the number of dog fatalities as possible, so I'll just run on ahead to the next level instead. Alright, so that last level was terrible. Where could we possibly go from here? Well, the answer to that question is into the darkness. Ooh. <coughs> so this level is your stereotypical follow a sentient orb of light that guides you through a pitch black level. Uh, level. It also has weird music that features people moaning and crying for some reason. I guess we could call this the scary level. It's got these weird mutant enemies who quickly break the illusion of being scary when they fall over and die. The real enemy of this level though is actually the acid pools dotted around the map. The challenge here is just to navigate and platform over these whenever they pop up and you really should because these things eat away at your health bar. You know what, given how rough the previous tree levels were, this one actually ain't too bad. As long as you make sure to follow the light around and just shoot the enemies before they come into vision, this is all pretty easy. Once you get to the end of the level, we find this weird blue guy. It doesn't say anything, and you can't kill it, so... I don't know, good for him, I guess. Anyway, let's get out of this place, because I am tired of hearing people moan and cry in my ear. Welcome to the fifth level of the prison that never ends. Mercifully, we've been given a short level this time, one that actually took me only a minute to be, although I think that might have been by accident. So there's only one room with a couple of guards in this area. Once you kill the guards, you'll come across this chair. Now it seems like this chair has a complex series of laser gates that you'll need to platform around, but I think I accidentally ran into it a little quicker than the game had hoped for, and I kinda just fell through it. So yeah, let's take a seat and move on to the final level of the prison. We. Alright, that was fun. So after all that, what does the final chapter of the prison hold for us? If you guessed the Executioner boss but harder, then fuck me, how'd you know? Well, I guess we're fighting our pal the Executioner again, only this time we now have two dogs entering into the fray, and in spite of me saying I'd try to minimize the dog casualties from here on out, uh, in this case I'm gonna have to make an exception. Come on guys, blame Cryo on this one, they made me do it. So initially with the extra dogs, this seems like it would be harder, but the room here is actually a bit longer than the previous boss arena, so luring the Executioner into attacking you actually allows for a bigger window of opportunity to hit him. A nice plasma shot in the back, and well, there you go. Oh yeah, the doctor. Well, she's here, hanging out in some cool blue liquid. Kali, there is little time left. I should have trusted you. Now you are the only one able to stop Kiana. Two Pax Corpus units exist. The first has been transferred to Luna Base 4. To destroy the unit, you will have to use and sacrifice four clones, who one by one can set off the system to destroy the base. The access is to be found in the temple. Okay, so two Pax Corpus units, one is located on the moon base, create and sacrifice four clones and find the access key to the temple. <sighs> Alright, that makes sense. <laughs> Okay, so that cool upside down pyramid is the temple. Don't ask me what it is or how we got here, but uh, we're here now. Interestingly, this is the only level in the game that takes place outdoors, so you can look up and admire the sky if you like. Okay, maybe it's better if we don't. I guess now is as good a time as ever to talk about the presentation in Pax Corpus, because I mean, you've looked at it long enough, and you can probably see where this is going. Pax Corpus is a cryo game, which means it looks pretty bad, but it's also kind of interesting. We've got tons of technical issues, clipping through all sorts of geometry, body parts phasing in and out, some lovely black fog, which honestly isn't something unique to Cryo, but hey, it's here in full force anyway, and of course the jankiest and most unusual animations around. It's clearly not very good, but I kind of like it anyway. The game clearly retains some of its Aeon Flux influence, and it shows in the character and world design, but it's just as if it was put into a blender and then spit out through a Eurojank PS1 filter. It's really something to marvel at. Come on, I mean, who's gonna forget a game with this in it? This is such good shit! Although, credit to Cryo, the sound design here ain't all that bad. Well, piercing gas static aside. 
The voice acting is fine for the time and relatively well done, and some of the music is actually pretty catchy. Although, as we know, there's also times when it is not very catchy. So all in all, the presentation, it's not good, but I don't hate it. And of all the areas, the temple is probably my favorite in the game, just from how different it looks. And of course, thanks to the weird tribal music that plays throughout it. It's a shame then that unlike the prison which has a whopping 6 levels, the temple here only has one. So here you need to work your way around to the center of the temple by running through a linear path in a clockwise motion. Of course along your way you'll find the pathway is littered with many different enemies, the main ones being those little glowy friends who explode when you shoot them. Now my plan for this level was the plan that I always use, walk and shoot. But turns out that's actually the worst thing you can do because this level has another secret gimmick. Whenever you fire your gun in this level, you summon these weird drone enemies, and these guys are by far the most annoying enemies in the game. It's not that they're very difficult, they function more or less like the guards, only fire slightly faster and take slightly more damage. Now in this level they ain't too bad, but just you wait. These guys are gonna make your life hell. So instead of walking through the level peacefully as intended, I made my way to the end of the level just firing non-stop the whole way and it only cost me most of my health bar, so I'd say it was a success. Once we reach the center of the temple and check out the weird floating statues of human body parts, it's time to fight another boss. Now, as is tradition, beating the boss requires more than just shooting at it, although just to be safe, I checked to see if that did in fact work and promptly died for my troubles. So the secret to beating this uh, slightly more threatening guard is to shoot it whenever its shield is down. You just gotta wait about 10 to 15 seconds for the shield to drop and then just rinse and repeat. Now this in itself isn't too hard, but you gotta do it 10 times. And remember whenever you shoot, you also summon down a little gray alien thing that fires at you as well. So you gotta make sure to preempt the shots coming from that, but if you can get that down, this is actually another pretty easy boss when all is said and done. With her out of the way, all we need to do now is go over to the teleporter in the corner of the room so we can visit the worst part of the whole game. Corpus units exist. The first has been transferred to Luna Base 4. To destroy the unit, you will have to use and sacrifice four clones, who one by one can set off the system to destroy the base. Alrighty, welcome to Lunar Base 4, or as I like to call it, the Space Cube. Now, this area only features two levels, but they are some of the most devious levels in the whole game, and you're about to see why. Also, by the way, did I mention that this game doesn't have a save feature? You do get a password at the beginning of each location, but it always restarts you at the first part of an area with no items, so yeah, it's uh, not the best. Anyway, Space Cube Level 1 isn't a very big one, although in spite of that, it sure manages to be an annoying one. You start out in this room with some big fans and a few enemies. Now, to get past here, you need to walk on this blue thing that gives off Pax Corpus radiation, which of course has some lasers that block your path. It goes about as well as you'd imagine. A little later, the path splits into two directions, but one is blocked off by lasers, so we've got to go the other way. This leads us to a narrow section where an alarm is going off and something seems to be firing at us through the fog. Well, I can't say I got a good look at what that was, but at least that probably won't happen again. So we get back and walk a little slower this time, and it looks like it's some sort of turret. Okay, I think I have an idea. 
Alright, that was dumb. So this time I see if I can maybe lock onto it using Kali's first person vision. <laughs> oh, okay. So remember ages ago when I talked about Kali's uncontrollable getup animation when she gets knocked down? Well, this is where it starts to suck. Really bad. So what you're actually meant to do is just fire normally at the turret, but only when its eye is not showing. I don't know why it looks like that, but it does make a fun noise whenever you shoot the eye though. The combination of a narrow walkway, the bullets constantly firing on you, and the tread of just rolling off the down platform, well, it's, uh, it's, it's not great. So after we eventually beat the turret, we jump over to the other side and pick up these four cube things. Turns out these cubes are going to be very important in a few moments, but for now, all we need to do is slap some more goons and enter the teleporter to move on to the next level. The level I fear the most. Alrighty, time for the worst level in the whole game, the clone level. Now not only is this level really damn confusing, it also has the most difficult combat and platforming sections in the game, spread out over one really long gauntlet of pain. So let's begin. We can activate this console near the start to begin the cloning process, whatever that means, and... Okay, I promise this won't happen again. So we begin the cloning process and move through the level. It's a dead end though, so what do you do? Well, remember those cubes we picked up in the last level? These now represent four clones of Kali who exist across the level. Each of these four clones have their own little challenge to beat, and by beating each of these four sections, it allows the real Kali to progress throughout the level. Sounds easy, right? Well, you're wrong. You can tackle these in any order you like, but we're going to do them in order from one to four. Clone number one section is a platforming section. It's pretty awful, as you'd expect. Now while I can't say the platforming in this game is very good, uh, at all, I think I've got it down to the level where I understand its quirks. I still felt like I was gonna fall to my death and die after every single jump, but we somehow made it to the end without dying once, which is uh, another small miracle. From here we get to the end section where you can shoot a switch to extend the platforms in Kali's area, and you can also shoot this weird clock thing, although it doesn't seem to do anything. The only thing left to do is go through this door, but it's locked. So to remedy this, we need to go back to real Kali and move a little bit further into her area and shoot a switch that unlocks the door in the clone zone. This brings us to a weird blue room where one of the Pax Corpus units is just hanging out. We've got to get all four clones to this room and, I don't know, absorb the Pax Corpus unit to destroy it. Well, we've come this far, might as well see how it all pans out. So now it's time for clone number two. Clone number two, you piece of shit. So this section is by far the worst one in the game, and you'll find out why almost immediately as you take control. So first you gotta jump over to this platform, no biggie, but as soon as you get over there, four of the little grey drone creatures are there ready to unload on you. Now this is bad for a couple of reasons. One, you've got a very limited area to manoeuvre in with no cover. Two, it takes about a second for you to line up and fire your shots, about the same amount of time it takes for an enemy projectile to reach you, and three, the enemy projectiles can stunlock you and take away nearly all your health in an instant. The amount of times I've seen the game over screen on this section far surpassed any other section in this game. And don't forget, game overs mean long ass load times and starting from the very beginning of the level again. Yeah, I suppose you could start with clone number two if you like, but it doesn't make beating this section any better. Now, through a mixture of careful dodging and pure dumb luck, I managed to defeat all four of the enemies and proceed with the remainder of the level, because of course, that's just the first part. Also, you see how low my health is right now? Well, there's no healing items in this level, and clone damage carries over to every other Kali in the level too, so I hope I don't take any damage in the next few sections. Immediately after you defeat the aliens, you've got to now carefully walk across a thin metal platform, kind of like a tightrope. Yes, I was very nervous doing this, but if there's one thing I'm good at, it's walking very, very slowly. After this, we've got another maze of some sort. I'm not exactly sure how this maze works, but it makes a little noise every time I run into a dead end and then a new pad opens up, so I just do this everywhere until the maze just kind of lets me go. And with that, we've managed to make it to the end of clone number two section. Repeat all the steps we do with clone number one and jack into the Pax Corpus unit. This section is thankfully another platforming section, although this time it requires you to shoot some switches to activate different platforms to create a path towards the end. This one is actually a little easier than the first one, which is nice because I really, really don't want to die again. 
We eventually reach the end, repeat the process, and finally take over our final clone, number 4. So remember when I said there's no healing in this level? Well, that's technically a lie, because during this section you can build up some Pax Corpus radiation, which lets you heal back up. So in reality, this probably would have been the best one to do right after the second clone, but it's too late for that, so let's just see what we're up against. Well, we've got erratic lasers, a hallway full of enemies, and also these blue dudes who like to chase you. That's how we heal, by the way. So yeah, pretty much an entire room designed to kill me very quickly. Now when in doubt, there is only one thing that we can do. Cross our fingers and just walk and shoot. Holy crap, we did it. Alright, pretend you didn't see that. So having somehow survived that, we can then get a little radiation heal off the blue guy, which thankfully came in handy as there was one more guy around the corner. And then finally we activate the last few clone switches. By the way, shooting the fourth and final clock unlocks a new limited power-up that lets you stop time. And yes, it is as OP as it sounds. All that's left now is to bring the final clone into the Pax Corpus room and finally move on from this awful, awful place. destroy the launch site. The Pax Corpus unit might survive. Welcome to the final area in the game, which in case you missed it, is the rocket silo, which conveniently houses both the final Pax Corpus unit and a big old rocket so we can blast it into space. So this area is unique because its levels are non-linear-ish. You'll see what I mean shortly. At this point the game likes to add in a nice mixture of the platforming and combat sections from previous levels, but if you've made it this far, nothing should really be a problem for you. Just walk and shoot and do not, I repeat, do not try to kick anybody. This level is actually pretty short overall, but at the end we enter into a room with three pathways. These represent the next three levels of the game, and you can do them in any order you like. Although there is a correct order, so we're gonna go with that. Press the console until the door you want is open, and then head on through. This is another short level. Actually, all of the levels in this area are pretty short. It's like the prison all over again, but in bite-sized, less painful chunks. The only real obstacle in this area are a couple of enemies that are dotted around the map, although the majority of them are out of the way and you can just ignore them. I chose not to do this and ended up looking like a fool because of it. Once you leave the opening area, you enter into a corridor with a rare pickup called a Mega Blast. I think this is one of the maybe two times you come across it during the whole game, and unsurprisingly, it's a screen clearing blast. The game's BFG, if you will. So beyond this, the only other area of note here is this location with a small platforming section, although getting up here just leads us back to the beginning of the level, so uh, yeah, I guess the only purpose here is just to get the one big mega power up. A power up that I definitely didn't forget I had for the remainder of the playthrough. Anyway, let's go back to the hub area because it's time for some clothes shopping. At the beginning of this level, we need to trick some guards into opening a door and letting us ransack the place. This can be easily accomplished by pressing the alarm that's located right next to the door. Can't believe how easy that was. This is another linear guard heavy level that wraps all the way around to the entrance, and as usual, as long as you're walking and shooting, this one is a cakewalk. Although it turns out this level has a friendly droid that you can program to help you with the enemies. So of course I shot it about 12 times and also killed all the enemies by the time I activated it, so... Yeah, enjoy your peaceful, carefree life, little droid. I guess this area must be the guards' quarters. I'm basing this solely off the number of guards in the area, and also this weird dressing room that lets us disguise ourselves as a guard. It's, uh, quite the look. The reason we picked up this outfit is because we needed to access an area behind our final door, so let's get to it. 
So this might actually be the best level in the game. If you enter into this level while wearing the guard uniform, it lets us partake in a combat simulator. And not only is the whole thing pretty much just walking around, looking cool, shooting dumb holographic enemies, whenever you shoot them, it looks like you're shooting somebody with a wacky gun modifier from Unreal Tournament. This is such good shit! If you think the floor is glitching out by the way, it turns out those are actually bottomless pits. I don't know what I was expecting to be honest. So this level is comprised of three different combat areas where you have to kill a target quota of enemies before it lets you access the next. They're pretty much all identical to one another, although the third arena has some particularly trolly pits to avoid. By the way, if you enter this level without the guard uniform, all you have to do is just run to the end of the area, so technically the uniform makes it harder, but come on, look at these guys. It was worth it. So, with our non-linear sections out of the way, it's on to our final two levels, which are both boss levels and both awful. <laughs> so this level is actually split into two parts. There's the boss, who you can actually go up and fight right away if you like, and there's the rest of the level, which you can opt to do if you want to pick up some fun items. Of course, that's what I chose to do, and I really wish that I didn't. So remember Pax Corpus Radiation? Well, this is the only level in the game where it ever really gives you any hassle, and quite a lot of hassle at that. At the beginning of the level, there's this circular area with highly irradiated blue men walking around in a circle. You can tell they are extra deadly because they seem to be carrying coffins with skulls on them. Not gonna lie, that's pretty metal. Now, these guys will bump up your radiation incredibly quickly. There's almost no way to avoid getting a little irradiated here, and if you even brush off them, then it's an instant death. The problem is, immediately after passing these guys is a platforming section that takes place entirely in an irradiated zone, and you need to do it almost flawlessly to make it out before it kills you. You should have seen my first attempt. So after we finally make it through this irradiated hellhole, we got our rewards on the other side, which are a few more missiles and unimaginable pain. So now that we know what's about to happen, this area gives you access to an unlimited special weapon for the blaster. It's nice of Cryo to give us this at the very end of the game, where you can use it like, I don't know, twice? We can loop around from here and take the safe room back to the beginning of the level, and if we blow up this thing, we can pick up a weird triangle logo. It doesn't seem to do anything, but hey, I guess it's nice to have. If you take the only other path out of the Blue Man Group's rehearsal space, you immediately enter into the boss room, which is another really metal location. It's like a chessboard with coffins. It's good shit. I'll tell you what's not good shit though. That guy. So this time we might as well equip our new special weapon and see how effective it is on the boss, although when you consider the previous few bosses, I ain't getting my hopes up. Oh, okay. This guy sucks. Why did he get the cool arena? Anyway, with that out of the way, it's time to enter into the mystery lift. I wonder what's behind it. Holy shit, it's Kiana. Well, I guess we're fighting the final boss out of, uh, seemingly nowhere? Seriously, I've shown you every story segment and cutscene in this game so far. It's like we missed at least, I don't know, one or two cutscenes explaining how we got here? I genuinely don't think these two characters have even interacted with each other yet in the plot, and I mean, they're on the game's box. How is this the only time that we meet? Okay, maybe we get something after the boss battle, so let's see how we get on. Now, as you can imagine, being the game's final boss, one of two things are gonna happen. Either the boss is gonna be stupidly easy and beatable in about 10 seconds, or it's gonna be the hardest boss in the game and requires some obtuse bullshit to overcome. And you'll be delighted to know that it's the latter. So Kiana kind of just floats awkwardly around in the air using some sort of uh, witchcraft or some very lackluster jetpack boots. So Kiana has two different attacks, she'll sometimes fire a spread shot at you that is easy enough to dodge as long as you're moving, although many times I was not moving so that went very well for me. She also has another attack where she flies above you and like blasts onto your head with her jet boots. Now while these attacks aren't all that difficult to dodge, Kiana once again seems to be impervious to pretty much all of your weaponry, be it hand to hand combat, special weapons, whatever, she just keeps flying around. Now to save myself some heartache and time mostly, I reverted back to Bloomer's amazing strategy guide to see what I needed to do. So tell me who in the audience guessed that you need to pick a corner, crouch in it, and then use an uppercut punch as soon as Kiana lands from her explosive attack. You can tell you've damaged Kiana cause a little bit of blood pops out whenever you do this. 
Now, after Kiana takes enough damage, she actually starts exclusively using the spread shot instead. And also, for some reason, this is now when she becomes vulnerable to our weapons. And I'm also very glad I knew this instead of sitting around waiting for it to land again like an idiot. As usual, once you know the secret to damaging a boss, the bosses themselves are usually pathetically easy. I figure now is the time to crack out the missiles, by the way, so enjoy Kiana getting taken out with only one shot. Okay, safe to say I wasn't expecting whatever the hell that is. So what does this mean? Is Kiana a robot? Is this even the real Kiana? These are the kind of questions I need to be asking myself when getting chased by whatever the hell this is. Oh wait, yeah, I still have missiles. Nice. Well, with that out of the way, the only thing that's left to do is activate the terminal and witness for the first time ever on the internet, the ending to Pax Corpus. Nice try, Kelly. You've perhaps stopped my plan, but it's only temporary. Pax Corpus is still alive. So, uh, a few things to note here. One, well, it looks like that was in fact not the real Kiana. And two, um, it looks like we fucked up. Remember a while back when we used the clones to destroy the original Pax Corpus unit and the doctor gave us this info? I've hidden the second Pax Corpus unit inside a rocket at the Alcyon Launch Center. Find the control room, set off the launch of the rocket, to send Pax Corpus off into the interstellar void, where it can do no more harm. Do not try to destroy the launch site. The Pax Corpus unit might survive. Well, it turns out we got the bad ending. That's right, Pax Corpus has not just one, but two different endings. But even more importantly, we actually haven't beaten the whole game. There's more levels. Now, you might be wondering what did we miss? How did we actually get the good ending to Pax Corpus and access the final area? Well, the answer might surprise you. Remember this little triangle thing we picked up about two levels ago? This thing is a Pax Corpus token. What does this do? Well, on their own, absolutely nothing. But if you have two, then they let you move on to the last area after the Kiana boss battle. And because of the way this game's password system works, we gotta be all areas of level 5 all over again. Yay. Don't worry, I'm not gonna make you watch that, but just in case you were wondering, this is where the other Pax Corpus token was located. Remember that room in 5-2 with the platforms that seemed to be kind of pointless? Well, it turns out if you slap this weird thing in the back of the room... <laughs> oh, that's our cryo. So now that we've returned to the final terminal in the game with two Pax tokens in hand, it's time for the final area of the game. I hope you're ready. This is the launch center, and if we want to blast the Pax Corpus unit into space and be rid of it forever, this is the place to be. Don't ask me how we got here, by the way. There was no cutscene in between the end of the last level and now, so it's, uh... Yeah, I don't know. Let's not ask any questions. Now, in typical cryo fashion, for whatever reason, the end of the game features maybe one of the shortest and easier levels in the entire thing. Well, maybe outside of the level with the chair, but I think this one is just easy on purpose. So this level's gimmick is that it has these yellow enemies that are friendly, I think. And there's also this frozen area that can do damage to you. I swear I've seen something like this before. Now, one difference here is that you can run through the frozen area and collect a new special item called the Cold Crystal. This item makes you immune to frozen damage, and not only is this the only time this item appears in the game, the frozen area is actually so short that you don't even need it to survive. The exit to this level is quite literally about 20 steps away from the crystal's location, so uh, yeah, let's get on out of here and to the real final level of the game. <laughs> now the good news is that this level is longer than the last one, but maybe by a couple of seconds. This level is seriously just a tiny maze full of enemies, a fan that you gotta shoot, and then you just press a button on a console, and that's it. That's the whole game. Cryo, you magnificent bastards, you've done it again. All right, so let's try this one more time. For the first time on the internet, the real ending 
the Pax Corpus. I grant you this victory, but do not underestimate me as Elise did. A day will come when you will no longer have the luxury of resisting me. Well, I hope that was worth sticking around for. Well, there you have it. That's Pax Corpus, and, uh, yep, it's a cryo game. This is, for all intents and purposes, an absolute mess of a game. An ugly, unfair, janky, janky mess of a game. Hell, even the somewhat interesting plot just kind of gets forgotten about midway through the game, almost dropped completely. Plus, they really just half-assed the good and bad endings and gave us those two crappy throwaway levels at the very end. The classic cryo anticlimax. Now, it's not like Pax Corpus ever really took off or anything, but whatever promise it did have really managed to crash down spectacularly towards the end either way. It is definitely interesting to wonder how this game might have turned out had it have kept the Aeon Flux branding, because outside of all the story stuff, this is more or less how the game likely would have turned out, and I mean, this could have potentially been known as one of the worst licensed games ever made. Instead, it managed to go almost entirely under the radar, disguised as Eurojank instead, which is probably the best thing that ever could have happened for it, really. But still, as with all cryo games, even though Pax Corpus is absolutely terrible, it is the kind of terrible that I think I will remember for a long time. I can't ever recommend anybody actually play through this thing, because if I had any hair, I would have ripped it out multiple times during my playthrough. But as far as weird obscurities on the PS1 go, eh, I kind of liked it for what it is. Just an unapologetic mess that, in spite of it all, still managed to function okay as a video game. Not a very good one, but a little better than Dreams at least. Now before we finish up, I got one more little surprise for you. Did you know that the unfinished build of Aeon Flux actually leaked onto the internet not too long ago? So yeah, here it is, I'm playing Aeon Flux on the PS1. What a time to be alive. So as we already know, this is pretty much the exact same game as Pax Corpus, but there are some interesting differences. For one, Aeon is able to aim her pistol down by holding the fire button, and she can also rapidly fire by tapping the button instead, and it is much, much better than what we got in Pax Corpus. Barely any delay on the shots at all, although to be fair, it is a little overpowered. Aeon also has access to mines and grenades, which actually kind of suck compared to the special weapons, but eh, at least they make more sense in the context of this game world, at least. And probably most notable is that the game now runs at 60 hertz at a nice stable 30 frames per second, which makes for a much smoother gameplay experience. I guess this also debunks my theory about a possible PC version of Aeon Flux because it seems going by this version of the game, the footage that's online is in fact just the PS1 build, but just looking a little higher res likely thanks to some emulator trickery. So yeah, overall, even in this unfinished state, it does seem like the game might have turned out somewhat better had the Aeon Flux version actually made it to the finish line. I mean, even the character model for Aeon certainly looks a lot better than Kali in my opinion, but maybe that's just down to personal taste. Also, fun fact, the secret area in the prison is also present in this build of the game, but if you take it, it drops you into a pit and crashes the game, so... Yeah, I think this is as good a place as any to finish up. Well, thanks for spending what is almost certainly, at least going by the amount of crap I wrote, another obnoxiously long video with me. I hope you enjoyed it. It'll probably be a little while yet before we return to try another game from Cryo's PS1 library, but you can rest comfortably knowing that this is only just the beginning, and as we should all know by now, with Cryo, it can always, always get worse. This is such good shit.